Hello and welcome to Gray County Life. My name is JC Coots. I'm Sarah Carmichael. We're very excited to be taking over hosting this program for Rogers TV. A big shout out, of course, to Mary Jane and Rhonda for hosting this program for a number of years. And we can't forget Charlie Brown. That's right. Of course, Rhonda would always bring her dog, Charlie Brown, into, into the show. We are both dog owners, too. Uh, both of us have two dogs each. Uh, you've got two very rambunctious labs. I do, yes. My older lab he's almost four his name's remy he's a chocolate lab and then i have a one and a half year old yellow lab who is named wesley now i would love to bring them in here it would bring me great joy but honestly they would destroy this room <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty heavy pretty uh pretty busy busy dogs i yeah. <laughs> i also have two uh, two golden retrievers one who's 13 her name is paisley she would uh be a great piece of furniture. I was about to say she'd become part of the furniture. Yeah. She'd probably also become part of the soundtrack because she does <laughs> snore quite loudly and uh, unfortunately uh, not super ladylike with the ability to, to not break wind. So <laughs> maybe not the best choice. And then Lola is the other one uh, mm -hmm. who's a one year old golden retriever. And again, would likely be a set destroyer. She <laughs> ate one of my socks this morning before I left. So uh, I had to get a new pair before we did the show. But we do want to let everyone know who we are. Uh, I guess, uh, Sarah, I'll ask you a few questions about you. Sure. Uh, you're from Owen Sound originally. I am. I was born here in 1983 in the old hospital, what is now an apartment building. And I grew up going to Sydenham, then I went to Strathcona, then I went to OSCVI, the old OSCVI for grades not for grade nine, and then grade 10 through uh, 12, I was at the new OSCVI, which is now Eastridge, and left at 18 to go away to college university, spent a number of years living in different places, and then I actually just returned to the community about four years ago. So yeah, born and raised, my family's all here, and uh, I love that uh, every time I you know, go out in the community now, I see somebody I know. It's definitely something I, <laughs> I missed about living in a small town. And even been away for four years. Some things changed, of course, because things always grow and, and they get bigger. But a lot of things stay the same, including mm -hmm. how great the people are that live here. Oh, we can't say enough good things about the community. People are just so generous. They're caring. They're kind. If you host an event, people show up and show their support. If you you know open a new business, people come in to be patrons and, and to shop. And it really is fantastic to always see that that support. And of course, you know, it, we live in a beautiful community. We've got, you know, a beach within 15, 20 minutes. We live right on Georgian Bay. We've got a ski hill an hour away. It really is a, a great place to be as far as uh, as you know being active and just enjoying the the outdoors now you yourself not from here you uh, but you have been living here for a couple of years it's been a few years now on the second go around I was here before about 12 years ago in the area and uh, I fell in love with the area I fell in love with a person from the area and got married uh, we had to go out to Western Canada for a few years to to find our careers which we did but then of course we came back because it is such a beautiful area. It's such a great place to to raise a family. Such a great place to to make lifelong friendships. And uh, having been across the country, and I know you you've been across the country as well, and we've worked even in some places across the country together. But they're just there is something here that just isn't anywhere else and, and that's why i'm really excited that we get to work together again on this show and we get to talk to more people from this community and what they do what they have to offer uh the people that they help we're going to learn a lot of stories this season and, and of course do our best to make sure that we make mary jane and Rhonda proud of us after doing such a great job for so long so we're very excited about it uh you had a pretty busy summer too i i know very recently uh, just as recently as a, a week or so ago you were in the Salmon Spectacular. Yes, I was once again a participant in the Owen Sound Salmon Spectacular and I got my derby ticket and I hit the water hoping to reel in that big fish to get myself on the board and I didn't. Again, I, I caught nothing, <laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing, which is always the way it happens for me when it comes to the Salmon Derby. In fact, the first year I was in the Salmon Derby, I took the week off from work so that I could sam, uh, so that I could fish for salmon day and evening and, you know, not have my work interrupt my fishing. <laughs> and I still caught nothing, absolutely nothing. And so I, at least I'm consistent, I guess. But yeah, no luck for me. Uh, my boyfriend Ryan is an avid fisherman and he was out uh, more than me during the week because he actually did take the week off from work. <laughs> and so he had more success. But on those days I did go with him, he caught nothing. 
and then he'd go the next morning without me and he'd catch fish. So it has been concluded that I am indeed bad luck. But so. you, you have caught fish before in the past. I maybe, have. Maybe not when they count during the Salmon Spectacular, but you, you can catch them if you I, need to. I too. have caught many fish over the last few years, but just never during the Derby. So I think maybe going forward, I might need to just stay at the big tent mm -hmm. while he goes and fishes, and, and that'll be my contribution. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand the fair of you, too. You, you made a, a road trip out east this summer as well, just to make things really busy. And you took the dogs. Yeah, we decided to do a, a little trip and we drove uh, across. We hit New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. We did some camping and yes, we had our two 80 pound dogs with us along the way, which made for quite an adventure. Uh, we didn't stay too long out there just because we did have the dogs and it was such a far drive. And I know you did the same thing. We, we did virtually the same trip, virtually to the same places. We did not take the dogs, though. <laughs> we took our tent, but I, I think our experience was a little bit different. It was less hairy. Uh, to say the least. There in was some, less pee stops probably. A lot less <laughs> were, were required, but uh, just loved it out there. What a, what a great place. And, Beautiful. Uh, uh, did you eat fish and chips every day or because we <laughs> no, did? No, actually I didn't. I <laughs> no. didn't. I had some fish and chips and, and you know, and we saw lots of sights and stuff, but, but it was, it was a very cool experience. Well, I hope that uh, whatever that you might have done this summer, I hope that you enjoyed it, whether it was a long road trip to to maybe a far off place, maybe discovering Canada, maybe it was just a staycation. So much was going on this summer. Of mm -hmm. course, Selville Beach was busy practically every day. It yeah. seems just last week we got that, that late rush of of, of summer weather, which perfectly timed up with the beginning of school, unfortunately, yes. Yes. for a lot of the kids. But uh, it was an amazing year this year. Absolutely. And we're looking forward to sharing lots with you on this season of Gray County Life. Coming up on the show today, we're going to be talking to Greg Hodenot from the Owen Sound Attack, Francesca Dobbin from United Way, and also Adrian and Kate Robinson talking about the Terry Fox run. So we'll be back with them next. program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. If you're facing Alzheimer's disease or dementia, you don't have to do it alone. There are people and resources that can help, and we'll connect you to them. Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. Our connections matter. Are you low on food, struggling to pay the bills, overwhelmed by life's challenges? When you need support but don't know where to turn, just dial 211. 211 connects you to the programs or services near you. 211, how can I help you? 211, help starts here. Lovely viewers, it's your host of On The Couch, Antoine El Hashim, reminding you to tune in for every episode of season nine of the longest running and most loved local queer talk show on Rogers TV. Check it out. <laughs> Executive Director, Steve Fisher. <laughs> And welcome back to Gray County Life. Of course, back to school time is upon us, and this year some kids are going to need a little bit of help getting back to school. The United Way of Bruce Gray is always there to help with their backpack program. And to talk more about that, we have the Executive Director of the United Way, Francesca Dobbin, with us in studio. Hi, Francesca. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. 
Thanks for uh, doing a, the backpack program once again this year. We've already started to hear some of the numbers, and I think it's positive to say that the, the amount of backpacks coming in are up, but that also means the need, unfortunately, is up on, on the other side of things. Let's talk about the need in our community. What have you been seeing in the last few years that this program has been running? So it leveled off um, in terms of need in and around 2000 for quite a few years. And so we knew that's basically what we were looking at. We expected to jump in 2020 with um, the pandemic and, and you know the, the job losses and all of that. And we saw a bit of that. And then it went back down um, to normal kind of 21. And then last year, out of nowhere, 400 more kids needed back to school supplies and another 100 more this year. So, you know, from 21 to this year, we're over 500 more kids have asked to access this program. And we've been able to meet that need um, with the supplies we have, but what it risks is next year's program because of uh, you know funding and fundraising for the program because we, we do all the purchasing in the winter. Yeah. Um, so we purchased based on last year and we're seeing a, a major demand and we have to talk about this as a community. Because parents are also coming in and asking for things like, how do I you know, get more food? I've been to the food bank. What else is out there? I need school snacks. I need this. What about clothes? What about shoes? Um, because wages have not kept up with inflation. And with 8% food inflation right now, it's a real challenge for families. Mm -hmm. So we're thrilled we can do a small part of it with our back to school supplies. But we have to have bigger conversations in our community about what's going on out there. Yeah, absolutely. The priorities, uh, you know, are, are, are hard for families because they're trying to, you know, keep the lights on and the rent paid and then at the end of the day they just don't have the extra for the extras like school supplies and yeah. so it's incredible that this backpack campaign is is in existence yeah and it's just really really the basics um you know we do the four age groups and and it's certainly not too late so if somebody's um you know listening to this watching this and is interested and and hasn't got school supplies for their kids because they hoped something else would happen come forward somebody get you know um they can certainly give us a call um they can call two one one and 211 will connect them and 211 will connect them to the other resources in the community as well so you know with 2400 kids your household is not the only one that's struggling right now yeah are there other ways that uh, the United Way is supporting students uh, currently in, in Bruce Gray with uh, obviously the backpack program getting the supplies is one but you also mentioned the food the nutrition is a big concern so we provide a grant to the breakfast program, so the, um, the Ontario Student Nutrition Program, which is otherwise known as the breakfast programs in the school, and that exists in every school. And um, so there is opportunities for kids to eat breakfast at school if there's not enough breakfast at home or if they're hungry. And we provide a grant to assist that program as well, um, but it's nowhere near enough. It basically feeds the kids for one day a year because it's like 17,000 kids throughout Bruce and Gray County that access that program. Yeah. Um, there's certainly other resources. I know some of our um, meal programs and our food banks do specific school snacks because, you know, peanut butter used to be a cheap protein you can't take that into a school because of nut allergies you have to be really really safe but then it becomes a marketing gimmick of this is a school safe snack but it's a dollar more a box than the other ones and we really want kids to have nutritional food we want them to have healthy healthy food and not eat a lot of processed food and healthy food is really expensive it definitely is yeah if you're going to the grocery store you you have to make those sacrifices you, there's choices that you have to make when you're standing there in the aisle going do i get it do i not do i wait for you know my next payday to to get those things and it's it's really too bad that they have to make those those choices but it's great to have those those breakfast programs in place so that at least kids are getting you know a nutritious meal to start the day now as far as um, the schools go now you uh, have mentioned before that sometimes the schools will contact you uh, about school supplies and other supplies that are needed uh, for the students and I assume you're always happy to, to do what you can in those situations yeah we do what we can and we try and meet the actual need mm -hmm. and and so we often have more questions when we first get that call or that email um, so a few years ago there was um, a couple of people talked to us about oh you should have calculators in the backpacks for the high school kids and at ten even ten dollars when you're doing 800 that's another eight thousand dollar hit to the program but not every kid needs a calculator mm -hmm. and we just don't have the capacity to ask that question every time and and it was just complicated so we said okay let's meet the need and we went to all the high schools and we gave every high school which there's 11 10 calculators as a library for their math departments 
and said, you know, this way you can loan them to the kids, and, and if the kid needs to take it home and do homework, have at it. Right. If they need to keep it because they need it for multiple classes, because they're doing multiple math classes or sciences, not a problem, just let us know and we'll replace them. And the feedback we got from the teachers was that the kids are really respectful. You know, the teachers have encouraged them to take them home. No, no, I want to leave it here. I want to make sure somebody else can have it. But it met the need. Mm -hmm. So instead of going out and buying 800 calculators that may not necessarily be needed, we had, you know, 100 calculators, put them out in the community, and then that was the need. Wow. And that's where, you know, taking a step back and looking at the bigger issue and the bigger picture and how do we address that piece is, is really um, impactful to our donors because we're not wasting money. Right. Um, it's impactful that we're not throwing away things that don't, you know, get thrown in the garbage because it's not needed. Mm -hmm. um, but also m helping kids succeed at school, which is the bottom line. What is the best way for people to help? Is it, is it a financial donation? Is it a donation of, of back to school items? What, from, from your perspective, what is the maximum easiest way that someone can make an impact? The best way to support your favorite charity is an unrestricted financial gift. Um, because then it's not locked into a specific program and, and charities have the ability to move money from one program to another depending on what's going on out there. Um, when you do give a restricted gift, so any money that's donated to backpacks stays in backpacks. Any money that's donated to the utility program stays in utilities. Whereas if we have funds that are just go do what you need to do, then it's a lot easier. We have a lot of purchasing power. When you're doing over 2,000 backpacks, like it costs $80,000. So when you can go to a supplier and go, <laughs> I'm gonna spend 80000 dollars with you this year yeah. what's the best deal that's the best bang for the buck yeah. you know certainly with food banks the same thing they can buy wholesale um, they can go shopping um, you know we have a quality piece so a lot of um, low-cost stuff the quality's not there it, it gets wrecked um, you know the markers dry out within within days so you know we have a quality piece so our our pencil crayons and crayons are Crayola yeah. um, because then they last the full year and they're not all broken you know we've we've done dollar store pencils and you just keep sharpening and sharpening and the leads just totally shattered all the way through so there's a quality piece to it as well but there's also a purchasing power yeah. so the most impactful piece for any charity be it Terry Fox be it us be it your local food bank is a financial donation because we just can take that that much further what are some options for people that are looking to make those financial donations? Uh, their one-time donation would be something, but uh, do you also have almost a like a monthly option if people want to sign up for that? Absolutely. So we have uh, we use Canada Helps as our online portal because it's very very secure. It's a charity unto itself. Um, within seconds of making an online donation, you have your tax receipt in your email, so it's all there. Um, you can go in and then download them when it's tax season, um, all in one place. It's a really great way. You can set up monthly donations five dollars ten dollars absolutely uh, you can go through donate today.ca gets us get you through to our portal you can choose from any of our programs that are running from utilities to the SOS to the backpacks all the things the United Way is involved <laughs> with um, food programs um, and we're more than happy to administer on behalf of a donor if they said, okay, you know, I want to donate to four or five different things. Just write it in the comments and we'll make sure those particular things are looked after. But a monthly donation just is so powerful for us. You know, we know it's coming, we can get going on that, and then we can budget accordingly. And the United Way, is, it's very big here in, in Bruce Gray. How many uh, member agencies do you work with? So we're funding, I think we're funding 17 organizations running about 25 programs right now. Um, I think we have seven programs with Canadian Mental Health Association specifically, as well as various projects that we're part of the partnership for or the lead on from the Good Food Box program to the SOS Homelessness Outreach Program um, to partnering and, and the Poverty Task Force, which again is a way of bringing the community together to discuss various issues from racism to anti-LGBTQ issues to you know how do we create a safer community for everyone. Is there an, another agency right now that you work with that uh, you know could use a, a little boost right now they're, they're they're really struggling their donations are hard to come by is, is there one that uh, that we can probably give a little bit of promotion to right now to help any food program right now any is really program. struggling um, because their purchasing power is down you know used to you'd be able to find a, a kilogram jar of peanut butter for $1.99 on sale and now it's five dollars yeah. so any food program is really struggling we have food programs that do meals 
and people want to donate for the food, but they don't want to donate for containers. Mm -hmm. And that's a big challenge for charities as well, is often you know, what's considered administration is really the, the nuts and bolts of doing the work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people will fund the food for the food bank, but not the bag, the grocery bag that the food is carried home in because I want to feed somebody, so I just want my money to go to food. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We need people to support the purchase of the bags. Right. We need to support the staff, people that are sitting down with people and going, okay, let's go over everything. You know, we have a financial literacy staff person that sits down and, and does budgeting um, and debt management and prioritizing um, as well as advocacy uh, to keep people housed. Our utility assistance program, uh, you know, I think in July we did about $30,000 in wood, buying cordwood for people because you got to get it dried and stacked before the weather hits. So we go out and say, okay, if you need cordwood, do it now. Don't wait till October. It's too late. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of our suppliers are running low by the time we get to October. So it's all of those things. And, and what's your rights? Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody comes and says, well, my landlord said they'll evict me if I don't pay 5%, which is above the legal guidelines. And it's like, no, here's the legal clinic, here's your rights, this is what you're entitled to. Mm -hmm. So a lot of community education um, to empower people to take control of their lives as well. And to, to reach out to United Way, if you need support in, in any of these areas, and, and you've certainly mentioned quite a few there, uh, even w when it comes to heating their homes this year, is going to be another big one. Uh, what's the best way to get in touch with United Way? The easiest way to get in touch with us is through the True One One system. So if you are dealing with multiple issues about, you know, and all these things I've been talking about very quickly, um, is Two One One. So it's a phone number. All you dial is Two One One. It's free to call. Um, there is a bit about if you're calling about this, press this. You know, so one, two, English, French, all of that, as well as our emergency housing program, is answered through Two One One. But Two One One can then, you know, if you got a piece of paper and a pen, can help help map out so whether you're in Paisley whether you're in Dundalk or Burgoyne they can make that connection to that local program what the criteria is how to access it you know what are some of the speed bumps what do you need to bring um, and make that connection um, and then they can certainly refer to us and, and give us and give you the number to reach out to us and I know there's been the uh, well try to end on a happy note I know there's been some change over there in the course of the last year you, you have someone new that you're working with uh, Christy who is someone that we we both know uh, how, how has it been like to work with Christy and what's she been doing <laughs> if people are going to go in the United Way office they might meet Christy so they, they probably know what she does absolutely will meet Christy um, she's away this week but that's okay um, uh -huh. people are allowed to to be away um, but uh, yeah she's been with us officially a year now um, and all our social media so if you're following us a tall on Facebook, um, Twitter, X, whatever it's called now, Instagram, that's all Christy. Then none of that is me. The really bad videos are me, and she has to teach me how to do that part. Um, but every time I turn around, there's a new social media, and I'm just really tired of learning new things. So it's like, Christy, yeah, what, are, what are reels? I don't, I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, she's a pro at reels. So, yeah. Well, it's great to have somebody that, that, that can help with the the side of the things that uh, younger people just know so much better than we do. I can't even download TikTok. It says I'm too old to download that app. <laughs> uh, let's look ahead to the future, uh, Francesca. What are uh, some things that uh, you want to work on or what the United Way might be working on? Any future programming? Anything that, that you're looking with an eye to to the future for how to best support this community? So we're having conversations around community safety and well-being. Uh, recent events in our community um, have brought a lot of concerns. Um, you know, we've had an overdose alert this week um, so we want to do more community education around um, substance use and substance use disorders um, we're looking to big things you know going into the winter around utility assistance as well as you know those big preventative things having you know will we be working on uh, a new living wage for this fall um, to you know let people know that this is this is about income all of this is about income. This is not about somebody needs to learn to budget better. You cannot budget better. You cannot budget your way out of poverty mm -hmm. if your income is not there. So we want to do a lot of education to our community leaders as to what's going on, as well as continue to address those issues, focus on mental health in our community because everybody is stretched and stressed. And what can we do to help?
Maybe. Obviously, there's a lot of important stakeholders to work with, uh, especially involved in the recent uh, events that we've seen in Owen Sound. Uh, the city, the county, city police, provincial police. Uh, just wondering how the relationship is with those stakeholders and with the public as well, and if, if the conversations and concerns are, are, are getting heard and, and addressed on a regular basis. So we focus on the facts. So, you know, unfortunately with uh, the most recent um, murder of, of Sharif in our community, that was not our homelessness population, this was not our mental health population. So when we hear things about, well, we got to clean up the downtown, well, that has nothing to do with that particular incident. Right. We still need to address homelessness, but we need to understand what homelessness is. And when we've got seniors living in encampments because they can't afford their rent, this is a housing issue, this is an affordability issue. Mm -hmm. So that's part of bringing people together to understand what the actual, actual issue is, mm -hmm. not just that gut reaction, which is perfectly normal. But what are the facts here? You know, and I'm downtown all the time at all hours of the day or night, and I'm perfectly safe, yeah. and, and I know that. And, you know, but I know most of the people that are in the downtown by name as well. Yeah. You know, and they're checking in with me, I'm checking in with them. We've got systems and we've got supports in place. So it's, you know, I love hanging out in the downtown area all the time. So we, we're looking for those conversations, but we're also looking to, you know, what are we going to do with the Out of the Cold program, supporting Safe and Sound uh, with an overnight open shelter. Uh, where people can sleep at a table. There's no cots on the floor because it's not, uh, the base is not configured for that. Mm -hmm. But how do we support people that can't find a place to live um, through the, a harsh winter? Yeah. Is, um, is there anything the public can do? Uh, specifically, you mentioned Safe and Sound. Is that a good area to focus on maybe sending some financial aid to to help with the specifically with the downtown homelessness program? Absolutely. Safe and Sound is our homelessness outreach program. Um, they're all going to be looking for winter coats, winter boots. So if, if you're tidying and you're shifting from, I mean, we're in a heat wave today. <laughs> so thinking about shifting to, to fall and winter, but if you're going through um, your closets and, and switching things around and oh, I should get some new winter boots, um, make a donation um, to Safe and Sound of that old winter coat. Um, you know, it needs to be appropriate. It needs to be a parka. Right. Um, and certainly, you know, dressy winter boots, not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, those can go to missions or any of the thrift stores, which then they help us out. So it all stays in the system. But it needs to be practical for donations to Safe and Sound. Yeah. Um, they will also be doing coldest night of the year. We're looking at doing coldest night of the year. We did it in Port Elgin um, and King Carden last year. We're looking to expand to Meaford and, and then one other community. Um, so supporting those fundraising events. Um, I know most Charities are always looking right now for board members. So if you want to sit in leadership and direct and support your community through your knowledge base and uh, your volunteer time, reaching out and, and... Leonard Thompson, 13 years old, diabetes mellitus, 65 pounds. Starve the child to let them live. The treatment's as cruel as the disease. It's a death sentence. Dr. Banting, this could be it. He's the first to receive this trial. But will it save him? It's not pure enough. So we try again. And again. And again. Before the discovery of insulin, Diabetes was a death sentence. Banting, Best, Collop, and McLeod's breakthrough has saved millions of lives. Leonard Thompson's was the first. Are you the type who would keep going or stop? It's not easy to stop when you have an addiction. Legalizing cannabis won't stop addiction. It trivializes its consumption. Let's be vigilant. If you need help, visit portage.ca. Here's what's coming up on the next edition of Gray County Life. We'll check in with Pat Scott from Big Brothers Big Sisters Gray Bruce to talk about their upcoming Golf for Kids Sake Golf Tournament. We'll also be joined by Renee Robbins from the Owen Sound Animal Shelter to meet another animal looking for a forever home.
Joining us from the Owen Sound Attack is Greg Hadenot, the Manager of Marketing and Communications. Hello. Hi, how are you guys today? We're good, how are you? Oh, not bad. Recovering from a week of training camp. So right. <laughs> Still yeah. recovering. One week in, it's got to be great. I, I always loved when you get into late August, early September, you walk in and you just get that first breath of air with the ice back in the building, and it's something, isn't it? Oh, uh, it's, it's a neat experience to be able to walk in an arena in your shorts mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and camps going on. And, and I mean, some of the neat things for the attack is that the guys, the guys love being by the bay. So the bay shore being where it is, when the day's done, they're in the, they're in the bay for a swim. <laughs> so it's it's a unique thing for Owen Sound, and you know, not a lot of whenever we have new players, they're like, "What? You go for a swim in Georgian Bay?" Yep, fifteen of them out there, right after the you know the last scrimmage every time. So that's amazing. Uh, there's a lot of excitement this year uh, surrounding the Owen Sound attack. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the changes that have taken place both on and off the ice, but uh, just around the community, it seems that there is this sense that this might be a really, really good year. Like there, there, there's some high expectations going into it. Are you feeling that? Are you hearing that from the community? Uh, I, I think we, obviously as, as a marketing guy, we have, have to balance it. We try not to put too much pressure on these kids because they are just 16 to 20 year olds, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, there, there's some expectation. You know, we've, we've got a top line of Colby Barlow, who's 18, Servak Petrovsky, 19, Cedric Quindon, who's 19, you know, these guys, could all be in the top five and top five or ten in scoring this year. Um, you know, 30 plus goal scorers. Uh, Goaltending is is a really we've got a really good tandem in in, in that and Corbin Votary and Carter George now being full time with the team. He's a, he's his own little bit of a cult. Got his own cult following <laughs> after last year. He does. Um, <laughs> and that and he just recently helped Canada to a goal at the Ivan Holinka Gretzky Cup. Um, you know, so you know, and, and on defense. You know, coming of age with with a lot of players, and we've got a good mix mix coming in there. So you know, a lot of expectation um, where it'll all fall. You know, I'll use the old Dale DeGray line of 30 wins is our target and making the playoffs. Because if you don't get there, you can't win it. So that's, that's true. I'll use his his to moderate that. But yeah, I, I think there's definitely some fan expectation, and we have that feeling that you know, th this could be a long run this year. Couple new faces uh, on the bench this year. You've got a new goalie coach that's come into yep. the mix. Uh, Darren Rumble comes in as an assistant coach. Uh, obviously, that's going to also play a, a factor in too. Uh, is there a nervousness from the players about seeing a couple new faces mm. on the bench? I don't, I don't really think so. No. Um, you know, it, they're they're really adaptable. To be honest, the players the players just go with the flow for the most part. Uh, Darren's a really good ad to our coaching staff. You know, we were sad to see Jordan go, um, but. You know, life takes you in different directions, but being able to add someone with the experience Darren has as an assistant coach, you know, is really going to help, um, you know, Wally and, and, and Sean and, and the team develop, brings a different perspective to the game too. Um, and then bringing Paul Gibson in, and unfortunately, I don't know a whole lot about Paul. It, it was, you know, we had hired a goalie coach and then he got a great opportunity to move up into the NHL. And then Paul, we brought Paul in and, and, and from the get-go, he's been great. The goalies love him. You know, you're already seeing him at practice working, working really hard with the guys on different things. So I, I think it's going to be a great fit. You know, they're going to develop it and, and develop the players and, and just keep moving in the right direction. Greg, obviously another big part of your job is, is you know, the off-ice stuff, including the marketing of the team. And yeah. also, I'm going to say you, you have a hand in what happens in the arena during game days yeah. as well. And Sarah, you're a big part of that too. Yes, yeah, I've been part of the attack family for a few seasons yep. now uh, out in the stands throwing ice cream at people um, <laughs> which is probably my favorite thing to do because who doesn't want free ice cream exactly. so I become very popular in that moment but it's been great to be part of that and I mean I love going to the games to work but also because I get to be there and it's basically like a high school reunion you know because it's what people do exactly. you know in sound on a Saturday night they they go to those they, those games now for the season coming up I understand the games are actually going to be starting a little bit earlier yeah, so there's some changes to some game times this year. Uh, some coming from a league perspective. Um, you're going to see some 4 o'clock starts on Saturdays. Uh, it, had to, it has to do with some travel. Uh, you'll probably notice either one, either the team we're playing or us in those instances have a Sunday afternoon game somewhere. Not at home, but somewhere else. So mm -hmm. if you think about it, these guys are ending the game at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and then they're back at the rink at 7 a.m. to head to wherever so that's the reason for that one but the we've we've moved our saturday games to seven just for a consistency uh factor so now most games you know we're seven o'clock across the board um 
from that standpoint. We still have our two o'clock Sunday games. You know, there is one six o'clock that had to do with a travel issue in there, but we do encourage the fans to kind of make sure they're looking at their schedule mm -hmm. and paying attention to our posts and things like that because there are a few games that are a little bit uh, different timing. Speaking of uh, games, games being at different times, uh, usually you'd have a couple preseason games at home. Uh, this year there's one coming up on Saturday, September 23rd, yep. uh, but you've got one that's actually going to take place off-site. Yep. So some, some other attack fans elsewhere within Gray and Bruce are going to get to see some attack hockey. Uh, tell us about the game that's coming up in Hanover. Yeah, so it's a funny thing. Sometimes things turn out just something pops up and you have to adapt and it turns out really well for you. So. Uh, you know, obviously with the RCMP musical ride coming, you know, this past weekend to the Bayshore, we've definitely, we had to, they had to take the ice out and, and all that for the city is a tough to turn it around so we play on the 20th. So we were asked to try and move our game, um, so we put it out there, we had an overwhelming response uh, in terms of communities that would love to host us. Uh, Hanover was picked, a lot of reasons, location and familiarity, we've been there before. It was a bit of a shorter build to, to having the game. Um, but I can tell you right now, the game is sold out. Um, we minus uh, the Monday before the game, there'll be we wait for the ticket list to come. So there could be a small block of tickets to come available on that Monday. But essentially, we've sold 1,100 tickets in Hanover for a preseason game. Uh, we're really excited for it. The Hanover Barons have been amazing to work with. Um, as well as saw the new Saugeen Valley Minor Hockey Group, which is the combination of West Gray and Hanover uh, previously. And then obviously the town of Hanover has been amazing. Love, you know, been great to work with them actually. Just, just had a meeting with them. So, you know, we're, everyone's excited for it. It's going to be a fun day. It's a preseason game. You know, um, we're going to try and bring a little more pizzazz to the preseason game there <laughs> than we normally do just to make it a little more fun. But yeah, it, right now, like I said, anyone who's looking for tickets for that, that Monday, probably afternoon, follow our social feed, look on our ticket website, that'll be where you'll be able to find them if they come available. For something that, that seems to have popped up as, as almost like, it might, this might be a happy mistake then with the, the double booking now, will this become an annual thing? Will you look maybe to, to play? Because there's so many great arenas and so many hockey fans all through Gray, Bruce, and as you get into the other counties, into Huron, there's new arenas, so uh, will it become an annual thing, do you think? 100% uh, a happy mistake. Yeah. Um, we have talked to our GM, Dale, uh, Dale DeGray, and we've had a conversation and essentially going forward for the next fall, a number of seasons, obviously that works. Uh, the plan is to host host our normal two games at the Bayshore, but also host a third neutral site game at a site to be determined. Uh, we, out of all the sites that did it, we but had about eight viable sites. And I anticipate this going forward. There's some sites that didn't bid because of timing and things like that that may even come into the fold as other mixes. I mean, we're talking about all across Gray, Bruce, Huron, um, you know, there's, there's a number of different places and who knows who the opponent will be. It'll be kind of dependent on where we are. Awesome. Uh, this year too, I know that there's uh, one change that uh, fans, viewers are probably going to see if they're watching the games on Rogers TV. There's going to be an extra commercial break. So that means, you know, a little extra work for us, but I'm, I'm wondering what happens in the arena then. Are there going to be extra games, extra contests, uh, things like that? So yeah, it's actually probably one of, I mean, there's lots of people out there going to be like, oh no the game's longer <laughs> it, it's literally two minutes longer you know our TV timeouts aren't like the NHL ones that are two and three minutes long you're talking about a 45 second to a minute break but yeah the plan is you know we've got some different partners on board we're hoping to do some more things that may just be pump up the crowd type stuff um, you know that sort of thing we're gonna have some different games Sarah doesn't even know what they are yet <laughs> what I'm gonna make her do yet um, but you know a, a lot of fun the, the goal is now to to have a little more fun and which we were a little more restricted before in terms of creating it, and, and, and some of it may be sponsors, some of it may not be, but you know, we're really looking forward to creating a little more of a fun environment at, at the Attack Games. It's always a great environment, especially with families uh, in mind. Uh, you guys cater to the kids so well. Uh, are the Sunday skates with the Attack, are they going to be back again this year? Uh, yeah, Investment Planning Council is back on board. Um, so yeah, we uh, all, all five Sunday games, uh, the first 200 kids through the door will get a free small popcorn coupon. We'll have some, we'll give away a couple of team autographed jerseys. There'll be a VIP meet and greet opportunity to win that draw uh, and meet your favorite player that night before the skate. And yeah, there'll be a skate with the team after the games. Um, again, get your autographs, get signatures. We do one big picture with them. Uh, you know, the Sundays have become 
you know, Saturdays are our big nights, but Sundays are right there. It's, yeah. it's just as just as busy, a little louder because you get the kids. It doesn't take much to get them going into into a game, and and yeah. So no, we're definitely back and looking forward to those days. And of course, the beginning of our season, the home opener. That's happening when. So home opener is Saturday, September 30th. Uh, playing the Kitchen Rangers. Um, so it's a big, be a big game, um, and uh, you know. Single game tickets don't go on sale until today at one o'clock. Okay. So um, you know we'll be able to do it. We're just kind of finishing the rolling over of seasons tickets and getting that all sorted, but they will be available. We've got some great new ticket deals as well available. We've kind of made some adjustments. We've been doing a lot of the same things for a number of years. So we've got a, a new five pack, a new ten pack, a new twenty pack, a weekday meal deal. So you know, obviously visit our website tackhockey.com to get more information about that before you would kind of pick in your games and, and take advantage of that. And there will be, I'll give you guys a little, something you may not know that kind of a tidbit, there will be announcement, hopefully before home opener. Back to the viewers to try and, <laughs> and figure out. So we've got a bit of a, bit of a thing coming this year and, and it's gonna be really exciting and, and something we're looking forward to do, so. I know something that uh, that you do the, that is special are the charity games yeah. every year. Uh, there's a few planned uh, again for this year. I believe uh, there's uh, one for Chapman House is, is back again this year? Uh, not Chapman House. Uh, Hockey Fights Cancer is back on October Hockey 28th. Um, and that kind of kicks up Cancer Month for the Cancer Society. Um, it's something, it's a, it's a charity or a group that's really near and dear to our heart. We've had a lot, I mean, I don't think it's even one in two people anymore. I think you, you, anyone can be connected to that as, as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, but we're bringing that back again. Um, the, we're actually new this year is we're working uh, with Grace, so that we'll have goals for Grace in March, uh, on March 2nd, and then um, we are actually hosting, launching a whole Black History Month program on February 4th, and it's actually spearheaded by Taish Jordan. Ooh. one of our players. It's something he, we've been working with him on some different uh, diversity and, and inclusion things over the last couple of years and this is kind of the culmination of all the work we've done and uh, you know we're really looking forward to be a special jersey for that for all these games but that one will actually include a whole month long black history um, programming on our social and in, in arena so the game will kick it off. And in terms of um people that you might need to help make sure that all these games happen successfully there's obviously a lot of game day staff that are required even some volunteers that are required are you looking for people do you need people this year we're always looking for people so I think I think like every business out there these days yeah. you're always looking for people um, definitely looking I think for still some concession staff mm -hmm. we're definitely looking for um, some from that end we're looking in, a, in Sarah's end of the world we're looking for another instance camera person, one of our persons kind of taking a bit of a step back in how much time they're spending. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but uh, so there's that, just attackhockey.com and uh, if you have any questions, call us at the office 519-371-7452. Uh, awesome, and just for reference, in order to work in the concession, what's the age for that? <coughs> um, it can be as low as 14, but okay. depending on the role, Okay. usually 16 or over. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, and the instance host, uh, Arthur, the camera person, basically they just follow me around and <laughs> <laughs> so and put me or put me on camera <coughs> when I need to, or um, you know, go out in the crowd with Cubby. Mm -hmm. Cubby, of course, is uh, some a near and dear. Uh, member of the Owen Sound Attack um, family and of course uh, we're looking forward to seeing Cubby again at all the games like Cubby's the most popular the most popular person at the games so <laughs> I will, mm, can we pause yeah sorry that's all right um, <coughs> I, I do love Cubby. Mm -hmm. my, my niece always loves to see Cubby whenever Cubby's running through the stands. And Cubby had some sick dance moves this past year that I was <laughs> not aware that uh, a bear could quite do the things that, that they do. Cubby, I think, takes Zumba lessons. Cubby is multifaceted. <laughs> yes, cu Cubby, Cubby has uh, <laughs> Cubby's done some training of their own um, in the last couple years. And yeah. we're going to see Cubby a little more again with that TV timeout. I yeah. think we're going to have a little more fun going forward with Cubby and yeah always a fan favorite uh, you know the kids love love Cubby and yeah. 
one of the most near and dear mascots in the league, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, They're, we're definitely looking forward to this, se this season. That's absolutely. Uh, seven OH or seven attack players have uh, gone off to NHL training camps this year. Uh, the idea is that most of them are, are probably coming back, including I think a lot of eyes are on Colby Barlow, uh, yeah. taken uh, by the Winnipeg Jets in the first round of this year's uh, uh, playoffs. Have you had a chance to, to talk to Colby since that happened? Because I. He always has seemed to me like a guy that's got a pretty good head on his shoulder, so I don't think this has affected him at all. I think uh, Colby is still Colby. Colby is still Colby. Colby yeah. is pretty even keel, obviously very excited to have been picked. Um, you know, that's the goal. Now the real, again, we always say it's like training camp. You, get, you make the team, now the real work begins, right? Um, so, yeah, Colby's looking forward to training camp. I mean, all the guys are. But, yeah, we fully expect it. And, and my, I always drop, I'm the guy who drops them to the airport when they go typically. And my line is, hopefully you don't have to call me because that's our goal. We want them to be there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think there's a pretty good expectation that uh, Colby will be back and, and that all the guys, for the most part, I think it, there's an expectation they'll be back in our lineup. They'll all land at a different in time, whether they're there for the op home opener or not might be a question mark. But uh, training camps, they all leave, uh, well, today and... Uh, tomorrow so mm -hmm. do you uh do you ever you and dale and maybe some of the other guys in the head office ever take a look at the schedule for the season look at your opponents and go okay these guys aren't going to be trouble this year <laughs> these guys might give us trouble have you had that conversation yet london knights i think are always one of those team kitchen arrangers uh, probably that i i think there's no i don't think we like to say there isn't anyone who's going to be trouble because i think if you start to look past a team you know inevitably you're you're don't underestimate. You, you don't underestimate. It becomes a game you should win that you don't win. I think, you know, our division, like always, the Midwest division and even the Western Conference in the Ontario Hockey League is the toughest in junior hockey, and I don't care what anyone says, anywhere. Um, so, you know, London's going to be tough. They always are. Kitchener's in a bit of a rebuild, but they have a new coach, and, and they're building towards something. So it'll be a real interesting to see how they play. Guelph is a team that kind of underperformed last year, but again, still have a lot of names there that that can really do for them and then there's you know Erie Erie's been building for a number of years what are they going to look like they just you know they have Schaefer now they got a good young group um, you know and, and we can't say anything about don't want to sleep on the west on the west division because again they, they've got some solid teams over there but uh, you know I don't think there's anyone we're looking past it's just I think it's going to be another year where it's going to be a battle and we hope to be at the top of the heap and stay there and and that will put us in a really good position for playoffs and and you know the season as a whole. Well, I think as as fans, we, we all thought there was some unfinished business from last season, and yeah. hopefully the attack are ready to get it done this year. Uh, again, the uh, the season coming up, the home opener is going to be September 30th, as the Barry Colts will be in town for a 7 o'clock game that night. Tickets, the game day tickets, go on sale at 1 o'clock today at attackhockey.com. Greg Hodnott, Marketing and Communications, thanks so much for coming in to talk about the attack. Thanks so much. talk show like this i'm sleeping with joe <laughs> carter by the way joe did not touch them all yeah i have to say like your voice is fantastic meet smitty listen i'm the brains here and Mitty. and i'm the good looking funny one this is the smitty Mitty show catch new episodes of the smitty and Mitty show wherever you get your podcasts
back to Gray County Life. We are now joined by Adrian and Kate Robinson to talk about the upcoming Terry Fox run. Hello, ladies. Hello. How, are, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Now, this is a very busy week for you. It is. Because your annual event is coming up on Sunday. So tell me some of the details on that. Yeah, so the biggest detail um, is start Sunday, 9 a.m. is registration down at Harrison Park um, by the Banjo Shell, so just by the restaurant. Um, registration's at 9, the actual event starts at 10. We will have stretches happen um, probably about quarter to. Um, you're able to just bring pledge sheets down if you've collected donations that are cash or check. Uh, the majority of people we find now do online. Um, so they don't technically have to register the morning of. There's just a little sign-in sheet that we ask them to do just so we can keep track of numbers um, the day of. And then afterwards, we will have a little barbecue and everyone hangs out for a little bit. And then, yeah, it's usually about two, two and a half hours for the actual event to happen. But the big key is registration starts at nine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, be there for then and <laughs> then. Even earlier. Yeah, we'll be there yeah. at the like seven. <laughs> Generally, we're there yeah. super early. So. Bring, the, bring coffee. Bring coffee, yes. Yeah. We love coffee. Well, I love coffee. I like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the goal for, for this year's r race here in Owen Sound? Yeah, so we have set kind of like a quiet goal for 10,000. Um, online, like on the actual Terry Fox page, it says 25,000. Um, and that is a massive goal set because we had a very big year last year um, due to one participant raising like $13,000 on his own. So that really jumped up the fundraising for last year. I think this year with kind of what's going on with the economy and, yeah. and everyone's really feeling like the pinch of their wallet, um, we think a really good goal um, for this year would be $10,000, just a good money to go towards Terry Fox, but then everyone is still just able to live their life as well, so. Right, absolutely, and everybody's welcome, dogs, yep. kids, strollers. Dog, dogs, kids, families, strollers, cats, if you want to bring it in a stroller, <laughs> like, everybody's welcome. We, yeah, you never yeah. know. You <laughs> never know. There is a pig in town. That there is. Yeah. Yeah. Lately, and I have there. seen a goat yeah. too. Oh gosh! Well, just all farm animals. Yeah. Sure, why not? Um, and you can walk, run. So it's not specifically just a run. Yeah. Um, you're able to walk. You're able to run, roller skate, bike. Um, okay. skateboard, pretty much anything. And it's a five kilometer distance? It's a five kilometer loop. Um, we will have markers along the route. We also have the Georgia Bay Amateur Radio Club every year comes out um, and they have some of their members stationed along the route just to like there's some tricky corners just to direct people so they go the right um, way. But yeah, it's five kilometers. Some of the very ambitious runners will sometimes lap it and do a full 10k. Um, but generally five. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a little bit of a history, obviously, with the Terry Fox run yeah. uh, for both of you. Number one, for running it here in Owen Sound, there's yeah. a bit of a history there, but also for w how you got started and the reason why you became a participant. Yeah, so when I was nine, um, I was actually diagnosed with the exact same cancer as Terry Fox in the same leg, in the same spot. So just like three in a row. So the medical technical term is osteogenic sarcoma of the distal femur is if you want to sound really smart <laughs> um, most people just know it as bone cancer um, so yeah I was nine when I was diagnosed with that and thanks to everything that Terry Fox had done and to the research that we've done with cancer from all of the money raised um, they actually caught it very quickly so it started out as what we thought were just growing pains because I was nine um, and then went for a test. My doctor said, there's water on your knee, but you need to get an x-ray. I think it was like a week. And it was like, something's not right. I got put, like sent down to sick kids. They did the biopsy. My mom and dad got called down. We had to go back down. That's when they gave them the news. Hey, this is what it is. You need to start treatment. So the treatment that I did was probably a year and a half long. Um, I did 20 weeks of chemo to start. And unlike because it's been it's advanced quite a bit although children are still very different um, I would be in the hospital for at about a week at a time so unlike some people that can go away and get their chemo and go home the same day um, I was in for about a week so it was 20 weeks and then they did the big surgery where they had to take the bone out um, I have an artificial knee now and two metal rods that 
create like my tibia and my femur. So my leg is like three quarters, not mine. Um, but I was able to keep it thanks to him, which is a, a very big thing um, for that. And then after um, the surgery happened, I did 10 more weeks of chemo just in case they missed something while they were in there that I really just got blasted and was completely put away. So yeah, it takes a big toll. Well, I was nine, so I don't remember a lot of it, but like your family really goes through it more so. Yeah. And then I think it was a year after I finished all of my treatment, our mom took over the Cherry Fox run and she did it for about five or six years um, after that. So we helped her mm -hmm. out there and our family was really big in it. We ended up then going away to college and that and swore we'd never be back in Owen Sound. And now we're back <laughs> and we both own businesses and we're like, okay, how do we get back on the bandwagon of this to kind of help out? So we took it over softly in 2019. 2020 would have been our first year actually organizing it, just yeah. us. Mm -hmm. um, and that is of course the year that COVID hit. So it was a do your own run. So we've kind of just been jumping hurdles and trying to figure things out as we go, but mm -hmm. wow. yeah. Even in 2020, like we're like, oh, we'll just go down to Harrison Park, mm -hmm. who knows, or maybe people that show up. And it was, it was great. Like there were people, they like kind of spaced themselves out, but people still showed up and did the actual 5k loop so even yeah. when we're in the height of a pandemic it was beautiful to see that people still came out to support mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely our community is great it absolutely. is yeah yeah and so as far as um this year um obviously you're organizing the event for for this weekend but yeah. going forward uh, I believe you're looking for someone yeah, to sort of take the reins. Yeah, we've made the tough call. It's not, it's not an easy call to make mm -hmm. with us both being small business owners in the area. And I can say for at least myself, Kate, probably the same. These have been the three toughest years that we've had as a business yeah. and neither of us have the full time that we need to commit to make this event as amazing as it can be. So mm -hmm. we've done, I would like, we've done amazing, but I know it can be bigger. I know it can be better. Um, and I know that there are people in the community that can see it past what we've been able to do. So yeah, we're hoping for next year um, that there will be new And we're definitely organizers. happy to like stay on as volunteers mm -hmm. and even kind of co-do it next year like we don't just want to give it to someone to run with it like right. we would still love to be involved we're just hoping someone will take over the reins and we'll just be part of the team mm -hmm. right because we do love the organization yeah and, and obviously there's so much meaning yeah. for your family yeah. so it hits home mm -hmm. absolutely we only have a, a few seconds left yeah. but if anybody is watching this and they're interested in maybe volunteering this year maybe yeah. they are interested in taking over the reins what's the best way to get in touch with you yeah both? so um probably calling either of our businesses with we we're both there every day all day yeah. i own sugar death baking kate is collective house design so pop into either of those um they can also facebook reach out to page. us on our facebook yeah. page there's a um, cherry fox facebook page for own sound that would be the other way we always monitor that as well all right okay. the terry fox run is coming up on sunday september 17th mm -hmm. adrian and kate thank you so much for thank coming in today to talk to us about it I think we, we were bang on for time there. All right. We good? Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Online betting is Bowman. Booyah! Woo! Oh yeah! You can win big! But you could also lose. There is risk with online gambling. And that's a reality nobody's shouting about. Learn about safer play at knowtherisks.ca. This is a man's heart. A heart in desperate need of medical attention. But because 78% of indigenous...